So people can get hurt if we don't do our job right. Okay. So we've got to be out in the field listening to people. In a consumer world, it's the other way around. You're going to have a customer advocate or someone like that who's probably a sort of marketing person, they're probably in, um, someone that does consumer engagement, they probably do a lot of it through online <coughs> surveys and things. Um, but you know, the product owner, there is really in, in many ways not a product manager as such because you're creating hypotheses, remember, not gathering requirements. So it works in quite a different way. Okay. Okay. So a product marketing person is really a very, very different character. Um, whereas, if, and if you think about this, the difference between the two is fairly simple. The product manager is there to listen. The product marketer is there to tell. So I'm telling you that we have the best headache pill in the world, in the market. And I'm telling you that I understand your needs and it will make your headache go away quickly. So therefore, my message has to be consistent. A brand has to have a very consistent message all the time. You trust it because it is a brand. You trust it because that type of car is a type of car you've always bought, right? You trust Spotify will get you the right music, blah, 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 blah. So that's what brands are all about. This person knows their market extremely well. They have probably gone and met with and engaged with the market. Stay with it, dude. You can make it. Um, they are knowledgeable about what the market cares about, what the consumers want, whoever it is. Um, they're very tight on budget, and they're able to write really, really good, um, uh, compelling content very quickly. We had a guy called Eddie that we hired in our office in Chicago. Eddie was a journalist. He's absolutely brilliant at writing blogs and content like that. What we discovered was our best route to market was, was through um, LinkedIn. Um, and through the creation of this blog. And he created a person called Henry, high earner, not rich yet. This was Henry, and Henry was a consumer, and he profiled Henry, and he wrote stories about Henry, and how Henry would go into good shops and bad shops, and what good uh, consumer engagement looked like, and what bad consumer engagement looked like. And it was really popular. I mean, incredible number of down downloads of that blog. Um, so product marketing does all that kind of stuff. They're responsible for generating leads, okay? So we, I showed you on the results slide that our pipeline grew four times, and that was their responsibility. Um, they're making sure that the, the, the public sees the same qualities and attributes of the brand uh, the, the whole time. They'll talk to analysts. Analysts are funny people who go around um, doing research on people's software. Gartner is the best known one. There's quite a lot of them. And people like me have to spend a lot of time doing interviews with these people so that they write nice things about you so your customer or customers buy your shit, you know. Um, and we position the company. We position the company versus the op opposition. And one of the other lectures, you'll learn how to do that. Um, yeah, so we're making sure it's consistent. It's out there. People understand it. And I always go and buy that brand because I know I can rely on it. Okay? All right. So, remember the mantra, we must build what the market wants and we must deliver it to the market in the way that the market wants it. So when we get inside one of these sprints, I told you we have a thing called a product definition group, okay? Now in the case of workplace, if this is our eight weeks from here to here, what we do is, four weeks before that, we hold our product definition group, okay? Leading up to that point, we've been gathering the user stories and the product manager has sat down with the engineering manager and we've done what are called t-shirt sized estimates. So for each of these problems we have to solve or stories we have to satisfy, we know if it's a small, medium, large, extra large, whatever. And that is an estimate, very roughly, this is a five day job, this is a 15 day job. Yeah. We always have a constraint. So if you remember, I said to you that we do three two-week sprints. We have five working days in a week. We therefore have 10 working days in a sprint. If I have 10 engineers, I have 10 times 10 engineering days. So I have 100 days. If I have two user stories, uh, and one of them is 50 days, and one of them is 70 days, 
I cannot complete both those tasks in that sprint. So I have to decide which one I'm going to build. Let's say it's a 70 day one. And I can then go and find six other five day stories and build them. Because six fives are 30 and 30 plus 70 is 100 and I can probably build that, okay? I'm, I know this sounds simplistic, I'm not patronizing, but that is the maths that you have to go through, okay? And so when we um, build our software, we have to fix something. So you usually cannot vary the resources. It takes three, four, five months to hire a good engineer. And it then takes another three months or so for that engineer to become really productive. So you're looking at like six months plus. So if I've got an eight-week planning cycle, I, I can't increase my capacity, can I? So my capacity is fixed. So that point there is absolutely fixed. So either I vary what I build or I vary when I release it. Both of these things are legitimate. So it might be I have got to build these things that will take 120 days. Therefore, I can't release it until then, because I'm driven by the content, okay? In our case, we decided we want to be driven by um, the time. So what we vary is the content. That's why we have a backlog, and we pick just enough stuff that we can fit it into the time allowed. Because we decided that the predictability of the releasing is what our customers told us that's what they wanted. Yeah, regular, predictable, because when my customers put my software in, they have to do stuff. You know, it doesn't just happen by magic. It isn't Spotify, it's not consumer. They have to configure it, they have to train their people to use it. They've got all sorts of tasks that they have to do. If they want to be able to plan ahead for doing this, okay? So, from our customer's point of view, it makes sense that the time is fixed. Therefore, we vary the content. Does that principle make sense? Okay. Um, and yeah, and it's normal that time and resources, that's the most normal way for enterprise software to be uh, built and re 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 released. You cannot throw more engineers at the problem, okay? It just, life doesn't work like that. Nine women cannot have a baby in one month. It does take one woman nine months to have a baby. Fact. Engineering software is a bit like that as well. A five day, a 50 day user story for one engineer is just that. It is not a 10 day user story for five engineers. Okay? You could have chunk it up to the most sensible size. Estimating, I think, is just about the hardest thing to really, really do well. And if you can learn that and you can build a skill on that, um, do you know what scrums are? Do you know about scrums and scrum masters and all that kind of shit? Get the estimating right. Okay? The guys will tell you that that is the biggest trick. If you want to be super employable, get super good at that. Okay? figure out story points, whatever it is. And when you talk to the guys, Russell, Joe, Ewan, ask them about this stuff. Go and talk to them afterwards. They've got, they've got plenty of time because they've got long journeys to make. And, you know, ask them about it. Learn tricks from them, okay? Okay, so I talked to you earlier about the notion of the MVP. Anyone tell me what an MVP is? What, yeah, what, what, what do I mean by that? Um, the smallest product <coughs> Create that you can then sell. Yes, that somebody will pay money for. Yeah. yeah. Or if it's a freemium model, then they'll still take it, right? Okay. <coughs> Just enough features, so not bloatware, make it smaller and smaller. There was a brilliant company in Dundee that I helped uh, called Hound Dog. They did um, uh, IT systems network monitoring uh, software. They're called GFI now because we sold it to a business in the States. Um, and they were really, really good at the MVP. Um, they, they had mouse maps. So the business is called Hound Dog, and um, the mouse maps and t-shirts were I monitor my servers doggy style. You know, everybody wanted these t-shirts at the trade shows. It was great, really good business. Um, so release it early, release it often. <coughs> That's a great example of um, an MVP. You couldn't do anything with text. All you could do was write it and delete it, right? That's fine. Nobody cares. Do you remember the first? Is the first, yeah. Um, there was no picture handling on the first version of Facebook. Can you believe that? For, version one didn't support pictures. Didn't support photos. You could write nasty things about other people, but you couldn't put a picture of them up. You know, looking like a handle. Um, so yeah, this intern um, who worked for your your man um, came and put it. 
And uh, yeah, the first version of Gmail was written in one day and, and released. Hard to believe. Didn't do very much. People used it now. You get momentum. Okay? These are real, real MVPs. Um, so, different kinds of MVPs. I mean, again, this, this is like estimation. It's a really, really hard thing. I'm making it sense. It's a hard thing to make decisions about. Um, but there are all kinds of different ways of looking at an MVP. Um, so, you know, and remember, what you're looking for is what's in that center of the Venn diagram. What are the things that m the most number of people um, are going to ask, ask for? And an MVP can be stuff you're just adding. It can be more features, but you do an MVP on the new feature and then you grow it. And if nobody uses it, you dump it. So, so remember, we're looking for what the market needs. It's going to solve a problem. Um, what we want the product to do, not how we want it to do it. Okay? This is absolutely vital. And when you write your requirements, when you do your um, presentation, please bear this in mind. All these slides are going to be available. So we need to be market-led. We, when, if you look at the way that we promoted Workplace when we were selling it, we described ourselves as a 100% market-led business. Okay? I have no opinion as to what my customers want. My customers do, right? But I have no opinion. I'm not entitled. I'm not a retailer. I have no entitlement to say what they want. Okay. So, have you heard of this dude? Go and look him up. You can click that thing. Um, if you want to get involved with an early stage business or start an early stage business, there's a couple of things that are worth reading. So, the Eric Reese book, the first chapter, the Lean Startup. Excuse me, may I take that? See if you can get a hold of this. Well, you can because it's in the library. Um, have you ever, ever heard of this book? It was written by an English professor um, in Silicon Valley around about the turn of the century. Um, and what it basically does is it tells you why products die, why they get born, why they get changed, and why they die. It's a really, really readable book. It's not like a business book. It is actually well written. Um, what it says is that before you launch a product, there's no money involved with that market. You then launch it, certain people will buy it, a lot of people will buy it, it becomes a bit old hat and less popular, and then it dies. Yeah, okay, I get that, that's really obvious. What it then says is, the people who buy it at different stages of this market are different people. So the, this is a geek, and I gave birth to a geek, believe it or not. I gave birth to a dude who is both technical and creative, and he's doing a BA, in production technology at the Royal Conservatory, right? I don't understand anything he says, but that's fine. Apart from when he says that he loves me, and that's cool. Um, so he does all this kind of stuff, and he buys stuff. He, so he bought a pebble. Do you know what a pebble is? A pebble is what an Apple Watch was before the Apple Watch was born, right? Do you know what a Diamond Rio is? Diamond Rio is the iPod before the iPod was born. Apple has never created a product category, ever. Not one. All they've done is, so I had a Nokia communicator. A Nokia communicator was this size, opened up. It was best for doing a sort of thing with a ball that you played along the screen, but you could type your email. It was the first proper smartphone. It was enormous and very heavy. You needed a small trailer to take it with you anywhere. Um, and then Apple came up with the iPhone. So they basically kind of copied stuff. Um, this book, Crossing the Chasm, describes that process. So geeks will buy things that don't quite work right because they like to take them apart and fix them. That's the first person who will buy a product. The next person buys it for a competitive advantage. The next set of people buy it because everybody else is buying it. The next set of people buy it because it's become cheap. And those people never realize they buy it. So this is the dude who owns a big, high-end, fancy car and says he hates electronics. I mean, they run the car. Right? So, the genius of this book is what it says is that none of this is connected to the other. What I've just told you is there are five groups of people who will buy a product and their motivation is different. And a market is people who have what? Money. Money and pain. pain. The same pain. 
So this guy doesn't have the same pain as this guy here. This guy needs it to be cheap. This guy needs it to be cool and fun and not quite working. Okay? So the human being's motivation for buying things at different stages varies. And the genius's book is it says, here's how you jump from one to the other, right? If you want to go through the whole product life cycle. And the chasm is between the two early stage small markets and the big market where people buy it because everybody else is buying it. And that's where you need to get to. And that's how you make big sales. Okay? And the gap in there is called the chasm. And he talks to you about how you get across it. It's a really good book. I do recommend it. This guy, just go and look at his blog. Um, he talks really well about what he calls these um, uh, seven deadly sins. Um, and his favorite one is the I live what features to build flaw. Right? So he just really, really makes the argument very well. Um, and he's another he's a professor at Stanford um, in Silicon Valley. Uh, and also, he'll give you some clues as well, some stuff that will help you with your assignment. Um, okay, so here's some decisions you as a group are going to have to have. Okay, um, you're going to have to decide um, what types of requirements you need to gather, and therefore that will inform what questions you put on your question set in order to then go and conduct the in interviews with these guys. Where are you going to get this information? So let's have some ideas. You're going to do these interviews, that's one thing. Where else are you going to get some information? In the internet. Can you be a wee bit more specific? Basically just doing like research on other products that might be in the market. So you could look up some competition. So yeah. what, what are you going to type into the search engine? Project, product manager, uh, help tools, something like that. Product manager, help tools, yeah. You could do, do, do that. Um, you could and a sandwich will make my hunger go away. I'll wait for the three course meal until dinner time. Yeah? An MVP is just the smallest thing somebody will pay money for. Minimum viable product. And the labs will go through that with you. This is how value is created in a software company. And I've applied this to every company I've, I've ever run. You basically create a deal, okay? Between sales, marketing, and engineering. And it's a story. And here's how the story goes. These sales guys out in the field will say, my customers want these things. If you don't build them, I can't sell the software. If you do build them, I can. And so marketing, in the shape of the product manager, takes all of these things, you know what a Venn diagram is? Yeah? Venn diagram, three overlapping circles. In the middle is what everybody wants. So we build that first, right? If 10 people want it versus two people want it, we're gonna build the one that 10 people say that they want, yeah? So that's how we set our priorities. We get the commitment back from engineering. Engineering builds saleable products. Well, of course they're saleable, Mr. Salesman, because you told us that's what the market wants. Marketing positions and sends the messages out to the market to generate leads. Um, and this brings cash back to um, pay for more engineers to do more development. So you get this deal between the different parts of the company that mutually support each other. And if it works, like an engine, it just goes faster and faster and faster, okay? This was the, and this is the last thing we'll do before we have a break. So I'll just tell you briefly the story as to how we applied this, okay, in my first 18 months. This is, uh, GigaOM is a, a market research company, right? And what they did was they did an analysis of all types of HR software that you can see described in the black circle on the outside. This software in the middle is focused on the needs of the employees. This is uh, on the needs of the employers. If we worked in here, look at this. Great big white space. Nobody had created an app that met the needs of the employees as much as it met the needs of the employers. So this app, where you can download it, onto your phone, so it's available, go and look it up, you can get it from Google Play or um, the app, app, Apple Store, and you can download it, and if you get a login, you then put in your details and you start talking about, this is when I want to work. I don't like working on Saturdays. I'm an only mum, I can't get to work before 9.30 because I've, I've got to drop little Johnny in nursery. Whatever it is that's going on in your life, if you can state that, and most of the people that work in retail are your age. They're millennials, they're Gen Y. 
right? Or however you choose to describe them yourself. So you guys, like my 19-year-old son who's at the Royal Conservatoire and my 14-year-old daughter who's at Valfort High School, live here. You don't live in my dress, you live in here. And that's fine, and you interact with the world so much through these devices. So the psychology is, if you have downloaded this app, like all the other apps you use, like Spotify, you're going to feel, to some extent, that you own this. And then you're negotiating with your employer when and where you're going to work. And the idea is that that makes you feel better about going to work and more motivated, so you provide a better service, so people feel good when they walk into the shop and spend more money, which makes the employer happy. Yeah? There's just a logic to it, and it works. All right, so what we did was we built that. Okay, we built that app there, and people absolutely love it. Absolutely love it, and it makes no difference. It launched in Tokyo, in H&M, because that's what they wanted. It then went to Metro in Turkey, it's in Ireland, it's in the States, it's all around the world. It's in Australia, and it turns out that human beings are all pretty much the same, and the same psychology pretty much works on all human beings, because we all want a good job, we all want to be safe, we all want to feel part of a team. And that's good. And you can play to that. That makes it a really, really big market. All right. So what we then discovered was there were three people. And these are called user personas. You have got to, when you make your presentation, define a user persona. So you have to define a big opportunity in the market, if there is one. There might be one, there might not. Then you have to define user personas. We discovered there were three people. So, headquarters, think about it. This person has founded a retail business. They probably started life working in a shop, right? They know how to engage customers and sell to them and get them to buy two t-shirts instead of one. And what they want to do is get everybody in all their stores behaving in exactly the same way. The chances of them really doing that are so close to zero that anything they can get that will improve that interaction with customers, they will try and achieve. So they want visibility. I want to know what's going on in my stores. These guys here say, well, yeah, I understand that you're going to set the policy and the targets. It's going to rain where I, I'm working next week. And if I have 100% of my people in and no one's coming into the shop, we're going to waste money. Or the sun's shining and it's a holiday and loads of people will be out and they'll be going shopping. I'll do 120 next week. Yeah? So they want empowerment to make local decisions. And then these guys want better engagement. They want a better work-life balance. Okay? So we understood exactly what they and they and they wanted. And we understood what the business wanted because it's the business that pays us money. So what you need to do is be able to define something like that. Okay? This was our value pro proposition. You can just read that. Conversion, in their words, is someone who walks across the threshold of the shop and then hands over the credit card, okay? But we've used their words. Those are words that every one of our customers would use for us, okay? And then, this is what it actually does, because this is what they told us they wanted it to do. So that when you go into a cell phone, a mobile phone shop, there's usually now someone at the front with an iPad, and then they've got the little booths, haven't they? And there's probably someone at the back fiddling about, right? So you've got about three or four different roles in the shop. And that's why you have to have a mix of skills. And going back to next, at the 27 million quid, productivity. This is what we want. So this is the kind of stuff you need to understand. Um, and this is what we built. There's a mobile app. Um, here is a day's demand. Okay, so that black line going up, it's like a jelly mold, is the demand. That's the number of people that will walk through uh, the door of the shop in 15 minute increments throughout the day. Okay, that's nothing o'clock and that's midnight. Um, where we've got um, some yellow, um, I can't remember which, I think it's yellow, that is unsatisfied demand. We think there'll be more people coming through, we don't have enough staff. Where it's red, um, no, red is unsatisfied demand, that, that's it, and yellow is wasted hours. So the original schedule that the business had created uh, followed the outside. And what, when we then went and improved it, we got something like a 98-99% fit. So we had just enough people to meet demand, 
without having them standing around with their hands in their pockets. And this is the Mo Mo mobile app, and it's Cr Christina, who you'll meet, designed it, okay? And it's designed very much to look like a classic Apple app, okay? Because the people who were using it were used to that kind of an in in interface. Um, yeah. And this was the results. So this is what happened to our business. Um, we went from mostly selling on-premise licenses, actually it's now 75%. So we're now a SaaS company, and that's a very difficult thing to do, because you stop getting upfront licenses, you start getting subscriptions. So the thousand pounds doesn't come at the start, it comes 10 pounds a month over 100 months. Think about it, the economics make that much, much harder to run the company. But as it builds up, all those Spotify subscriptions, that's what you're looking for. Um, best revenue in 30 years is still going up. Uh, overall, uh, that's annualized recurring revenue. 40%, our SaaS went up 86%. We've actually doubled the size of the, the business. Our pipeline, which is the leads coming into the company, grew four times. Um, at the start of this year, 80% of our projected revenue we already had, even before we opened the doors on the 1st of January. Um, and when I arrived, it took um, 250 days to deploy the product to a customer after they paid for it. We then got it down to 30 to 50 days, and the new platform we built, the one that goes every four weeks, we, the first one we did, we did in five days, including training. So the customers get it so much faster, and there's so much happening. Ha All right. So that's the end of the first lesson. Um, that, I hope, has given you a context as to what product management is about, roughly what the process looks like, and why we do it, yeah? Hopefully that's clear. What you're going to do for your assignment is you're going to pretend, and each, you're not doing it individually, but you're doing it as a group, so it will be a group of three or four, that you are the product manager in a software company. The aim, the, product, the strategy for this business is to provide software to help product managers get better at their job. Okay, so that process, the bloody diagram I showed you earlier on, you're gonna help people to get much, much better um, at doing that, okay? At managing this process here, okay? That's your, you're aiming to create a piece of software that will do that. So what you're gonna have to do who are your customers? Who's your user going to be? Who's going to use your software? So, I want management type servers in the VR. What's your software going to do? It's going to help product managers to do their job better. So, who's your customer? Who's the user? Who's going to use this software? Managers. Product managers. Product managers, yeah. I know this is blindingly obvious, I just want you to say it, right? So, product managers are going to use your software. So, who are you going to interview to find out what product managers want? <coughs> product managers. Yay! Good man. All right. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you uh, the email addresses and mobile phone numbers for about 50 product managers around the world, okay? But some will be in Europe, some will be in America, and might even get one from Australia, okay? You're going to create a set of questions that will help you to understand the market requirements. You're going to have to find out if there's a market in the first place, and you'll do that by some online research. But you need to find out, is there a really big problem that product managers have that has not yet been solved, that we can help them to make their life easier? They could maybe do it faster, more efficiently, whatever, right? So. Um, you're going to need to find out whether or not there are any products out there already trying to do this. So is there really a market? You need to find out what it costs them, how much are they therefore going to pay to make the problem go away. Okay? So you're going to get to interview some real product managers. Um, you can also ask the guys who are going to be lecturing you. You can ask them questions as well. But what you will do is you'll set up um, three or four interviews You'll do some online research as well, and you put all this information together. Um, and you will come and you will stand here and you will say, just like Dragon's Den, I think there's an opportunity here. Or maybe, I don't think there's an opportunity here. That's also a very good answer. 
Okay, and here's how we did it, here's the research we did, and so on. Okay. You'll have great fun doing it. They are fantastic people. Some of them have been doing it for 10 years. I only ask them to do two or three of these interviews um, a year. Um, the interviews are typically about 45 minutes long, although if you get really engaged with them, they can sometimes go on a bit longer. If you have good, good, good questions and so on, you'll probably do it by Skype um, because a lot of them are a long way away. If they're any really close, we sometimes get some from NCR, in which case you can go and have a coffee with them or something. But essentially, um, you're going um, to come and you're going to present the idea for a software tool designed to make product managers work better. Okay? Um, you're going to do it by creating a bunch of user stories okay? and creating a backlog, framing up the uh, market problem, the opportunity, the key requirements and all these kind of things. You're going to prepare a positioning statement. So our software does this it, and it makes headaches go away really fast. Right? Nothing acts faster than that. You're going to write something like that. Okay? And then you'll come down here and you'll make your pre presentation. And you can use any medium you want. I don't care if you do it um, using flags or Prezi or PowerPoint or tap dancing. It's entirely up to you. Okay? And give your business a nice funky name as well. You know, we had some great ones last year. Okay? And don't do boring slides like mine. Okay? Is that, is that clear? Every piece of homework you'll do, including the one I give you today, will form part of your presentation. All right? Are there any questions? Let's go and get a break. 15 minutes. Go and get a cuppa. We'll get back here for uh, 10 to 12.
saying so far, is it making sense to you? A lot of business is <coughs> common sense. You know, a lot of people make it too complicated. Um, a lot of it is very logical. So. Are we missing one person from up the top? No, they're down there now. They're down there. Oh, yeah, sweet. <coughs> okay. There's a couple of dudes in here. Any of you ever actually worked in a software company? Whereabouts? Where, like geographically? In well, Utah? It was a company for um, software for microscopes on nanoscale. Okay. So it was mainly even processing. Yep. But I wasn't in the actual industry development. I was more in the sales marketing company for that. Okay. While I do have an IT background. And where was that? That was in the Netherlands. But it's an international company. So basically every university in the world has that. Okay. Which bit in the Netherlands? Sorry? Which bit in the Netherlands? Hofstor. Okay. I used to have a company in Hofstor. Hofstor? Yeah. That's close to Skipper. Yeah, yeah. 11 minutes on the train. From landing to being in the office. 11 minutes. Plus a minutes to my office. It's an amazing airport. Yeah. Who else has worked in this one? Uh, over the summer, I worked at a company in Edinburgh. Uh, over the summer, I worked for a company in Edinburgh. It does okay. three badges for security personnel. Okay. What was it called? 86. I said it's a free call. It's not, I mean, it's just, it's not a proper startup, but it's quite recent. It's only had about over like 50 personnel, including the sales marketing development. I'm glad. Okay. So it's quite Okay. okay. We'll give it um, one more minute for this, these two guys to appear, and we'll get going. Okay. 